Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending this National Centre for Energy Systems Integration session. I'm just going to check that we've been able to let our guests in, and it looks like we have, which is excellent. So I'm the chair for this morning's session. I would like to advise you all that the session has been recorded. If you have any questions, please do feel free to use both the chat function or to raise any questions that you have at the end of the, the final 15 minutes of this one hour slot. Um, the session today is focusing on the great work from my colleagues in the area of energy demand. We have three talks for you today, each about 15 minutes in duration. Um, it's really exciting, this work that you're going to hear about. This work has informed both UK national and international uh, policy in the energy transition. The, the demonstrator projects working close with industrial and community stakeholders has really enriched and informed this work and it's continued the work throughout the five and a half years and into some of the future work some of my colleagues may mention today. So I'll let us move forward into some of the, some of the great um, examples that we're going to hear today. The first talk will be on modelling building demand of communities by Professor David Jenkins of Heria Watt University. So I'll ask David if he can share his slides, please. Good morning, everyone. Hopefully you can see my, my slides OK. Uh, yeah, I'm Dave Jenkins from Heria Watt. So I'm going to talk about some of the building and performance and building energy demand work that we did uh, through the duration of, of SESI. So when you start enough uh, looking to characterize energy demand of the built environment, there's various uh, tools and models and options that you can, you can look at. So you kind of got this toolkit of um, really quite different models. So one thing we use a lot is, is dynamic simulation. So people may be familiar with the likes of IES and NG Plus and TAS. So models like that that are quite focused or traditionally quite focused on individual building modeling have a pretty good understanding of laws of thermodynamics, uh, quite detailed in terms of the modeling calculation engine behind that. You might also be looking at steady state calculations. So these are generally uh, simpler uh, calculations which um, uh, are used primarily with energy performance certificates. Uh, and in fact, across Europe, uh, steady state calculation methods tend to be the uh, the foundation of most EPCs. Uh, statistical modeling of empirical data. So uh, clearly, as we get more and more access to real energy consumption data, um, there's lots of really interesting research on things you can actually do with that energy consumption data to not just understand individual buildings, but to characterize energy demand on, on a much wider scale. And then there's also stock modeling, which tends to lean uh, mostly on steady state modeling for estimated energy demand of buildings at a sort of regional and national scale. So this is the kind of sort of pick and mix of, of methods that um, as a building modeler you're, you're looking to, to choose from when, uh, when approaching the, the challenge of, of energy system modeling. So um, with that in mind, uh, the things we were looking at was first of all we wanted to be able to operate our model at a suitable spatial and temporal scale for multiple buildings uh, and also doing that with a, an efficiency of calculation that makes that model run feasible at the scale that we're trying to run it. Obviously, you might you start with a very complex calculation engine for a, a single building, and then you, you, you try to extra extrapolate that for many buildings. The efficiency of that process gets more and more challenging as you, as you upscale. And kind of related to that efficiency of calculation, uh, access to key data sets to define the inputs that we need for our models. It's all very well having a very detailed study of a single community where you might have been studying that, that community for, for a number of years. Um, but if the inputs available to that community were only available because of, of that lengthy study, then the replicability of your method, the idea that you can transfer that method to another region becomes a bit more limited. So we, wanted, we want to try and use inputs that we know are accessible and available to researchers. And then obviously looking at the output metrics that are actually useful for urban scale analysis when pointed towards the kind of energy systems challenges that we were looking at within, within SESI. And that again requires an understanding of spatial and temporal resolution, what's, what's useful, what's meaningful for, for energy systems work. 
So our approach was to firstly utilize this higher resolution that you get from dynamic simulation to create uh, multi-building energy demand profiles. So not just generic annual characteristics of energy, but something that gives us some indication of peak demand, load factors, uh, transient demand characteristics. And data sets we were, were tapping into. First of all, we were using GIS and OpenStreetMap uh, data for building geometry and orientation. So that helps us build up the actual um, the, the buildings themselves, the dimensions of the buildings, the, the placement of the buildings. We're also using uh, existing EPC databases to uh, provide construction material and heating, ventilation, air conditioning system information for those buildings. We're not interested in the outputs of those EPCs so much because we're generating our own energy demand values, but we are interested in the inputs that are recorded in uh, within the EPC process because that defines uh, what the buildings actually are. And then also um, we were looking where available for smart meter data because when you're using a more detailed dynamic model, it's not enough just to have generic descriptions of occupancy and, and activity. You need to know transient descriptions of heating control, transient descriptions of activity, because your, mo your model is potentially running on a, for example, half hourly resolution. So that's a, an in a challenge on, on the level of input that we need, but um, we were able to obtain that from a smart meter data, which I'll, I'll touch on in, in a second. So to give you an idea of, of the model as it's being run, uh, this, this bit of work was, was led by our researcher, Peter McCallum. So this uh, is uh, 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 up in Orkney. So we, we were working on, at the same time, uh, a project called Reflex, funded by Innovate UK, as part of the NG Rev consortium. So um, this gave us an extra case study uh, up in Orkney with, with some pretty good uh, data describing that case study. So in this case, for example, if, if we take the area of Kirkwall, which is that top box, we're able to use our, our model to automatically identify different geometrical archetypes of those buildings. So for example, we could, um, in, in purple there, you can see certain types of dwellings have been identified automatically by the, by the process. But we're also able to, to tap into, a, in effect, a library of different shapes of buildings and then assign those shapes to, the, to each individual building that we're, we're looking at. And we can do that at different sensitivities. So we could define every house by the same archetype, or we could define every house by its own individual archetype or find a compromise in between where you might have 10, 20 different house type archetypes for the community that you're studying. And that enables us to develop these three dimensional archetype models, which are then suitable for, for this dynamic simulation. But before we do that, we need to dress those buildings with construction material and heating technology information. So we extract that from the EPC databases, which we cross reference with this, uh, with the, with this map in front of us. So we know we're matching the right EPC with the right dwelling. And then on top of that, as I mentioned, the importance of activity and operation, and in particular, a heating control, we can infer that, that level of activity from smart meter data, either from generic smart meter data sets, if we want to apply this in a sort of generic template kind of way, or if the data exists for those individual buildings, we can assign specific heating controls for those specific buildings based on what we infer from the kind of on-off scheduling of technologies from that smart meter data. One thing we did um, dip our toes in as well is, is to look at whether we can um, map those activity schedules with different types of uh, household occupants. So there's a database called the ACORN database, which provides some level of socio-demographic information for different households within communities. Um, there's, understandably, there's quite restrictive licensing agreements. So there was an issue to making that part of the sort of public domain part of the, of, of the model. But that's something that probably requires a bit more work, whether you can actually um, create a sort of a, a template library of, of activity schedules based on different socioeconomic um, classifications of households. But we inform that all into our, into our building model uh, for an individual building, and then we uh, aggregate and, and simulate these, these buildings all together to give us an aggregated energy consumption at scale of that community, which is then obviously more useful for the energy systems level. To give you an idea of, of you know, some of the things you can do with, with that model for specific applications, we ran this, this bottom-up modeling procedure for trying to understand the impact of changing heating technologies at scale across, across a community. Uh, this was some work done by one of our researchers, uh, Vivi Vatugiu. 
So she was looking at uh, an area of 300 dwellings. Again, you can see that, that picture, which is automatically identifying the different archetypes within, um, within that community that we modeled. We looked at different scenarios. So in this case, what happens if you, if you replace all the, the, the baseline heating systems with uh, air to water heat pump? Uh, but of course, you can also play about with that. You can choose just to apply that, that heating technology to a certain classification of, of house or certain area of that community. So you can, you can play about with, with different scenarios. Um, you've also got to account for things like the different sizing. So because all these houses are different, and hence a bottom-up model, because all these houses are different, um, you want to resize your, your heat pump system or whatever it might be for those individual houses. So we were able to do that based on the assumed thermal demand and then mapping the size of heat pump uh, on that value and then running uh, dynamic simulations for all those individual buildings for all those different heat pumps um, and looking at for example price signals or carbon intensity to uh, to decide what kind of control might be used with with those heat pumps I mean that's that's kind of the key point for both SESI and also the reflex project that we were working on are you able to adjust the control of that system in a way that might benefit the grid in some way so we're not just looking at total carbon and carbon savings and then of course the nature of a bottom-up model is that you can uh, disaggregate your results in any way you choose. The graph at the bottom shows what happens if you just uh, pull out the, the detached, semi-detached semi and mid-terrace housing, but you could, you could uh, break down that uh, disaggregation in any way you choose. And that's useful potentially for a local authority because you can approach that and say, okay, which, which houses might we target first if we're trying to do a rollout of heat pumps? Um, that graph shows the, the, carbons, uh, the energy savings from the baseline to a fabric retrofit scenario and then onwards to a fabric plus heat pump scenario. So it gives you a bit of disaggregated uh, estimate for, for, for energy saving. And then you can also pull out other information around, um, we were particularly interested, as I say, in demand flexibility. So we could play about with different uh, tank volume uh, for, for heating storage and how that might have an impact on the running costs or the carbon emissions and, and, and so on. So once you have that model um, kind of within your with that community uh, uh, specified within your model you can play about with any scenario you like uh, essentially just just to note that to finish off some kind of work with, with which this is kind of led to and associated work um energy modeling isn't just about physical thermal modeling it's also about the use of real energy consumption data so we've been running sort of a, a parallel to this work we've been running um statistical modeling of, of real energy demand data this is work from uh, my colleague sandhya patida so just very quickly on the left, I've, I've, I've linked in a paper there for those that want more detail on this, but um, what we're able to do is to take an observed energy demand profile and, and decompose that into constituent parts. So you can look at different periodicities of, of variations um, that might be impacted by weather or occupancy and so on. And so you're able to, just through the statistical process processing without any submetering, you're able to disaggregate different trends within your overall energy demand profile. And that's useful for noticing correlation with, with other aspects such as, as weather, but it's also useful for synthesizing new demand profiles. If you're trying to aggregate energy demand from building level to energy system level, and you don't have enough individual demand data for the individual buildings, our approach here is to say, well, we, we can learn from the data you do have, synthesize more demand profiles for virtual dwellings and use that as part of the aggregation procedure. And that's where you've got on the far right hand of this of this slide um, the, you've got an observed aggregated demand profile of just in this case i think 15 dwellings and then you've got the equivalent from a, a synthetic uh, 15 dwellings and you can see you get a similar shape they're, they're still quite noisy shapes but that's because this is only 15 dwellings if you if you continue and, and add more dwellings to the mix you get smoother and, and less diverse profiles uh, and and the match is is actually quite quite good in the way that synthesis works and then just finally as well I think it's, it's interesting at the moment that EPCs are traditionally not really part of the energy systems discussion because they, they operate at a building scale and they're relatively simple modeling. But it's interesting at the moment that um, at the European level, which is what drives EPCs, um, we now have a, a, a new proposed indicator called the Smart Readiness Indicator. that is looking at whether EPCs can actually give useful information to, amongst other people, uh, those working in the energy systems level to understand how a building might be able to respond to signals from the grid. So this smart readiness indicator is, is trying to capture 
uh, a building's ability to control heat, energy, and um, respond to signals from the grid um, within that EPC assessment process. So it's an interesting bridge between traditional building energy assessments and the requirements of the local energy networks. And just, I think we're all understanding that demand reduction and demand flexibility has to kind of be part of the same, the same piece. Um, big questions as to whether it works within that EPC framework and whether it's even useful. But that's something we're exploring at the moment uh, with the Horizon 2020 CrossFit project. Um, hopefully we'll have more results on that in the coming months as that project uh, rolls on. But I shall finish there. So thanks for listening and happy to take any questions at the end of this session. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much for that, Dave. And for anyone that's joined us a bit later, you know, please note we are recording the one hour session. Um, feel free to post your questions within the chat function and we'll collate them at the end. Uh, or equally, you can just engage in that final 15 minute slot. And we will move on to our next speaker, please. I can see that you're sharing your screen. I don't hear you though, Melinda. Yeah, you're muted. Can you hear us, Melinda? She is, she is there. Are you hearing her, Lindsay, no? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, she's muted. She's going one minute, so I don't know if then she disappeared off my screen. <laughs> We can move on to the next top if, topic if we have this technical difficulty. So that's my recommendation, uh, Rhiannon, and if we can give control to uh, Sonam or uh, Benoit for the next talk in the meantime, okay? Yes, I'm not sure who's sharing their screen at the moment. If it's Melinda, if you could stop sharing so we can, so Sonam can do. Yes, thank you. Uh, hello, uh, good, good morning, everyone. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Oh. All right. Uh, uh, once more, uh, apology for the te technical glitches. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Sonam Narbu. Uh, this is the summary of our research work on real time control and fair sharing of renewable energy resources in energy communities. Uh, our research work is uh, motivated by a real case study from communities of uh, 200 households in the Reflex project, the UK's largest uh, smart energy demonstration project running on Orkney Island in Scotland. Indeed, uh, uh, this is uh, one of the tangible outcomes of the collaborative research uh, between CECI and Reflex projects. Uh, well, uh, the future of energy supply uh, calls for innovative solutions to build more decentralized, less carbon intensive and fairer energy systems, such that the consumers are able to use more locally generated renewable energy and take control of their own uh, energy supply. One innovative solution is, for example, a peer to peer transactive energy system. And another innovative solution is to create uh, what we call energy communities in which people can invest together or individually in their own energy production system, such as uh, wind turbines, rooftop solar panels and batteries, and can then share energy and financial benefits uh, within the community. Hence, uh, there has been a growing effort in the UK and world at large to enhance the local energy resilience, particularly at the community level, to build a more smart uh, local energy systems. Uh, 
energy community projects uh, often involve uh, jointly owned energy assets. Uh, but uh, given that not all the community members have the same size energy needs or demand profiles, a key challenge is how these assets can be efficiently controlled in real time and how the energy output from these jointly owned assets should be shared fairly among the uh, community members is still an open question of uh, research and practical importance. Crucially, such real time and fair sharing of energy must also consider the physical assets degradation and the technical constraints of the network. Indeed, uh, there is still a need to integrate the network constraints into community energy optimization models, which are key to building a realistic uh, distribution grid models of the energy communities. In this research uh, work, uh, we propose to answer these questions by using the tools from multi-agent systems, the distributed AI, and the cooperative gram theory to design a method that not only leads to an increase of local renewable energy consumption, but also to provide a fair way to redistribute the benefits obtained from jointly owned uh, local renewable energy assets. Specifically, uh, we have developed a new algorithm for smart control of uh, community energy uh, production assets uh, such as residential and community owned batteries to use more uh, locally generated electricity and then propose a redistribution mechanism considering the uh, physical assets degradation and network constraints. First, uh, we compare the case uh, when the individual households invest in their own uh, energy assets versus uh, investing in a large uh, jointly owned community energy assets. Our case study and data sets clearly shows the benefit of uh, join, jointly owned or pooled energy assets. Then next, uh, we provide uh, uh, several uh, practically applicable and computationally efficient uh, uh, redistribution mechanism to share these outputs from these jointly owned assets between homes in a much fairer way. Uh, driving into some of the specific of the results, uh, results of the research, uh, yearly energy bill savings, which is a fairly intuitive indicator, is used to compare the economic performance of investments in individually owned assets uh, versus investment in jointly owned community assets. Uh, results uh, clearly shows that uh, jointly owned community assets uh, provide a substantially lower annual bill. Uh, Community assets are usually more profitable if the network charges within the community are considerably reduced, but this is uh, subject to uh, local network constraints. While considering the network constraints, uh, even though the benefits of the community uh, jointly owned assets are reduced due to curtailments, still community owned assets provide a substantially lower annual bill. Uh, furthermore, uh, important thing to be uh, noted, uh, uh, these economic results are obtained with the same unitary cost of the assets for the jointly owned uh, uh, community assets as for the individually owned, uh, which might not be the case in a uh, real world scenario. Whereas in practice, the unitary cost of the community owned assets must be much, much lower due to the economies of the, uh, due to the economies of the scale effect. Thus, uh, more savings can be obtained from uh, community owned assets by considering the economies of the scale in the unitary cost of the assets. Hence, these uh, results clearly shows the importance of determination of uh, fair distribution or allocation of benefits uh, achieved in uh, community projects. Uh, to share these benefits, uh, we propose a computationally efficient and fair uh, redistribution mechanism based on uh, marginal contribution of each house households. A key concept uh, from coalitional game theory and distributed AI, looking at what each member contributes uh, to the local, to the overall uh, local community's bill savings. Then the proposed uh, uh, redistribution mechanism is compared with the existing state-of-the-art uh, uh, redistribution mechanisms. Uh, figure here shows the annual bills of individual households of 200 households uh, uh, after redistribution of community savings obtained from the jointly owned community energy assets uh, for the proposed and the state of the art uh, redistribution schemes. Our proposed uh, method, uh, method one and method two of the 
existing state of the art uh, redistribution mechanisms provided the lowest bill and thus the greater savings for the community households. Hence, uh, the two methods are further compared uh, to evaluate the economic uh, fairness of the redistribution scheme. So this is a, a comparison between the two methods uh, which provided us the lowest, uh, uh, lowest uh, uh, bill. The crossover point between the redistributed bill curves uh, clearly shows that the proposed marginal cost redistribution method uh, yields to a greater reduction of annual bill for almost 67% uh, of the uh, community households compared to the state of the art method. Hence, under the proposed uh, marginal redistribution method, more households can decrease uh, their annual bills than the existing state of the art uh, redistribution method. While it is true that uh, large consumers benefit slightly less under our scheme, but however, these households with higher demand profiles are the households who already obtain the highest bill reduction in the value as compared to the household with uh, lower demand profiles, as illustrated in the figure shown in the earlier uh, slide. Therefore, the proposed uh, redistribution method uh, mechanism achieves a fair uh, redistribution then does the current uh, uh, state-of-the-art uh, redistribution mechanisms. Uh, from a pragmatic uh, perspective, uh, having a 67% of households in the community, which are mainly uh, small consumers benefiting from the proposed uh, redistribution mechanism would lead to a greater social acceptance, uh, which is key to incentivizing more communities to form coalition and invest in jointly owned uh, local renewable energy assets. Uh, currently, uh, we are working uh, on the peer-to-peer -peer energy trading framework for energy communities. Uh, in future, we plan to extend the current model to include the local flexibility service to increase the revenue of uh, energy communities. Uh, for further details uh, and uh, to highlight a brief on the narrative impact, uh, the key findings of the research uh, SF now has been disseminated to publication in repeated journals uh, related to energy and smart grids. Uh, so for further technical details, uh, uh, one can obtain by referring to the first uh, open access applied energy journal uh, paper published by Elsevier and the uh, second uh, uh, open access paper published in ITPLE access. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your time and uh, patience. Uh, please get in touch with us uh, if you are interested in further clarification and collaborations. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Sonam. That was an excellent presentation. And um, if you can stop sharing your screen now, that would be excellent. And as I've said at the opening, if people have some questions, do feel free to use the chat function. We will try and collate them all at the end and uh, ask our speakers to, to give you some um, feedback and supporting information. And let us see if we can now have our third and final speaker for this session um, provide us with uh, another 15 minute talk. Uh, Melinda, are you okay to share your screen? Yeah, hopefully it will work this time. Uh, once I shared, I have two screens. Once I shared my screen, uh, I lost all controls of the meeting. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't oh, no. even unmute myself. So now I have just unmuted myself before I share the screen and hopefully that will work. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, you are seeing my screen, I guess. Uh, Thank you, that's excellent. And you can hear me, so that's good. <laughs> all right. So um, my name is Merlin Dandoni. Uh, I am a research associate uh, currently working for the University of Glasgow. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about what we did for uh, the SESI project in the uh, fourth work package, the demand work package. Uh, this is work with fellow colleagues. At the time we were uh, located at Headwork University. Now we are at different uh, institutions. Uh, the work was, of course, under the supervision of uh, Dr. Valentin Robu and Professor David Flynn. Um, 
before I kind of get into the detail of the details of the work, uh, just an overview of today's talk. So I'm going to uh, talk about um, essentially a model that is about the day ahead scheduling of demand and uh, energy trading of a local community. Uh, the model follows a multi-stage optimization approach and is based on multi-agent uh, systems modeling. Uh, the model is also able to capture uh, differentiation in end users' energy preferences and flexibility. And it's a nice tool for exploring uh, scenarios, uh, current uh, and future energy scenarios for local energy systems. Uh, the um, uh, presentation will conclude with uh, a practical application of the model uh, that we show for the Finborn Energy Community. This is an uh, eco village uh, in the north of Scotland that has been used as a demonstrator site in SESI by other uh, modelers, uh, other researchers as well. So just a few words about the background. So we have uh, in the recent years, uh, the rise of, of consumers So uh, energy policymakers have been encouraging consumers to own their own energy assets. That would be micro generation, batteries, EVs. Um, we uh, encourage consumers to participate in demand response programs, share their energy and even trade their energy surplus. Uh, at the same time, we have seen the rise of energy communities. So that would be local communities. Uh, that would be when consumers join forces, either to invest uh, jointly in community projects or um, to uh, coordinate in order to achieve uh, better operational uh, decision making uh, for optimization of their use of resources. So these kind of trends have led to the transformation of the power grid into becoming more decentralized and more complex to manage. And this calls for new modeling paradigms such as multi-agent systems modeling, which can be used to, uh, to represent more realistically uh, energy systems uh, uh, as they are transforming. Uh, just a few words uh, about what are multi-agent systems. So what is an agent, first of all? So an agent is a computational entity that lives in some environment. And uh, as we say, it is flexibly autonomous. So that means that it is smart. Uh, it can act and react in order to uh, satisfy its own goal or objective. Um, and has something that we call social ability. This means that it can communicate with other agents in order to achieve a common goal, for example, to negotiate uh, and so on. So a multi-agent system is a system of two or more uh, 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 such intelligent agents. And is, uh, as a modeling technique is becoming more relevant for energy systems uh, as it it, it is a good way of testing through simulations how we can uh, see complex, how complex system behaviors emerge from local decision making and a large number of agents. In our model, uh, what I'm going to show today, a software agent encodes the decisions of a consumer of, of uh, a household, uh, the energy preferences of such consumers and its local uh, information. Now, um, um, two emerging uh, solutions uh, for managing decentralized and complex energy, uh, complex energy systems are local energy markets and smart local energy systems. Just in brief, what is a local energy market? So this is a marketplace that is able to coordinate energy and flexibility from distributed energy resources and consumption within a confined geographical area. And uh, what do we mean uh, in, in the context of this work by smart local energy systems? Is we mean that the energy management is optimized locally before we uh, allow any interactions with the upstream uh, grid uh, or main grid. And it is in this context that this work is mostly relevant. So what we have developed is a local energy market model uh, where we allow energy trading within a local community. So uh, conventionally, uh, a consumer buys and sells energy via an energy supplier. And you can see here in the picture here on the right that um, 
You can see in black here the energy flows or power flows. Uh, this is the real uh, kind of exchange of, of power in this network. And you can see the cash flows uh, when the uh, energy is traded by an energy supplier. And uh, typically the consumer or the prosumer has an import price when he buys energy from the grid and an export price, he, he, uh, the prosumer is rewarded with an export price when he injects power back to the grid. Uh, typically though, the export price is orders lower than the import price. Therefore, uh, an alternative kind of solution here that we propose in this model is that uh, trading is also allowed within this local area, within this local zone, and the trading is coordinated by a community agent. Uh, who is also uh, responsible for determining the price uh, for uh, this local trading. Uh, essentially, this results to the, uh, the energy schedule or trading uh, essentially becomes an, um, um, a combination of uh, different uh, levels of optimization, <coughs> excuse me, uh, at a household level uh, and at a community level. Um, now, uh, in our model, an agent uh, is, as I said, a software agent that represents the prosumer, the consumer, or the household. So the household may have generation, uh, may have uh, demand. We split the demand into two parts, uh, one that cannot be controlled, and we call this a must-run demand, and part of it that can be controlled, and we call this flexible demand. So this can be, for example, uh, battery system, electric vehicles, um, some thermal storage, uh, and even smart appliances that can be shifted, that their operation can be shifted in time. Now, crucially, each agent uh, also may be willing to shift this flexible demand uh, in time. Of course, when this happens, uh, there is discomfort that is being uh, uh, felt by the user, and this discomfort, uh, um, uh, the discomfort level uh, depends on the willingness uh, to shift. So different consumers might have um, a different levels of uh, flexibility, let's say. Uh, the amount of load shifted and the time distance between the desired and the, uh, the desired uh, schedule and the actual time when the demand was actually allocated or shifted. Uh, the objective of this household agent is to optimize their consumption. Uh, that means to optimize, to find the optimal schedule for their flexible demand according to their type or class. And um, I, will, I, I, I will explain here what we mean. So we have assumed three different uh, types of agents. So cost-driven agent agents act to minimize their energy bills or increase their profits, low carbon agents act to consume more green energy, and social agents act to maximize tradings, trading with peers in the community. Now, uh, traditionally, we usually um, a model energy as an homogenous product. However, we have seen that in several uh, cases, uh, this might not uh, uh, hold true. Uh, for example, consumers may be willing to pay a premium for renewable energy. Uh, also, we know that uh, different consumers may be driven by, by different values. So their, their, their behavior uh, might may be driven by different uh, values. These values can be kind of uh, more egoistic, meaning, for example, uh, when we want to, uh, um, to act according to our, our own self-interest, uh, in order to minimize uh, uh, bills, for example, or prices, or preserve our convenience or comfort, uh, while uh, other agents may be driven more by altruistic values, such as caring for the environment or caring for others. And this is why we, uh, we created these classes with these different classes of agents to capture this, this uh, differentiation in, this, in, in such preferences. We also have a community agent object objective, uh, the community agent who is the coordinator, and the objective for such an agent is the optimization of the aggregate of community scheduling for uh, maximizing the community self-consumption. 
just a little bit more detail here how this is achieved in practice. So we have this sequential uh, uh, optimization of energy that comes in stages uh, and according, of course, to each agent type. So at the first stage, we have we allow for a super local matching of energy. So here, uh, agents um, act uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to match demand to supply at a household level. Any flexible demand or any excess energy is then communicated at the second stage to a community agent uh, who runs an optimization to uh, achieve, to maximize the community renewable self-consumption. And finally, at the third stage, uh, we allow for uh, optimization with, uh, regarding trading with the main grid. So here, depending on the type, for example, the cost-driven agent might want to shift their demand in, uh, uh, in times when the time of use tariff, the retail uh, price is low, while low carbon agents, for example, may um, uh, uh, want to shift their demand when uh, the carbon grid intensity uh, is low. Um, this was in brief the model, so we did apply this to uh, the Findhorn uh, case study, the Findhorn community. Um, uh, this had, uh, so we applied this to 210 household agents that we, we, we take data, real data from uh, representative types and depending, of course, on the data availability that we have for this community. Uh, we picked four representative days uh, to allow for seasonal vari variations. So we have winter, summer, and we also have a uh, weekday and a weekend to allow for the, the change in patterns of demand and generation. And what we can do with such a tool is that we can run and we can explore multiple scenarios that uh, allow us to explore what happens with the different agent types, uh, with different levels of flexibility that we might have in the community, uh, what happens if we increase the renewable penetration and so on. And just to show you here the results of one of these uh, scenarios. So here we have a scenario of 50% prosumers, 50% consumers, and an equal uh, distribution on the agent types. So we can see here, uh, this is the energy, uh, the gray is in the conventional way of trading, and the other one is the community trading, the, the pink one. And we can see that the average kind of yearly revenue improves for all agents. Uh, we can also see that uh, improvement in the grid imports, the maximum value of the grid import. This is important because this is, uh, the, is it related to the peak demand of reduction. Uh, also, we can see a significant improvement in the maximum grid export. This is also important because this kind of uh, relates to the reverse power flows that we see at, uh, uh, at areas that have a uh, lot of renewables. And there is also improvement on the, uh, on uh, uh, improving on the local green energy consumption. So we, we improve on that. Uh, another important question is what happens uh, as we increase the scale of the community or as we increase as more consumers, uh, as more uh, agents become consumers and they uh, uh, participate in the local trading. So what are the aggregate effects? And we can see here how the revenue is um, uh, allocated and distributed between the uh, prosumers and consumers. We can also see um, where the total revenue flattens out at, at which point, and therefore this means that uh, any further uh, development wouldn't offer any additional benefits. Uh, on the right, you can also see uh, what are the effects on the grid profile, both imports and uh, exports. So just a few kind of final remarks. Um, Data are important, so the results uh, that we have seen, we can, we can see that these vary across seasons, of course, and uh, according to the load and generation profile, so uh, it is important to use uh, good data and in a larger scale. And also price formation matters, so we have ex uh, experimented with different pricing strategies. Uh, this relates both to the community, how the community price is determined, but also how the retail price uh, would affect uh, such optimizations. Um, 
And uh, we are now uh, working on um, uh, developing a decentralized approach for the community trading. And also we've been working on, we will be working on the um, uh, individual asset flexibility rather than on a household level uh, flexibility. I will stop here for the sake of time. And uh, uh, thank you for, uh, for uh, um, uh, listening. I'm happy to take uh, questions. Thank you very much for that excellent presentation, Melinda. Um, really, really interesting stuff. And I'm, I'm sure everyone can appreciate how important and timely all of this work is when we look at some of the, the cataclysmic events we've seen in this UK energy market with, with pricing and uh, you know, the, the fuel poverty situation just increasing exponentially. Um, Rhiannon, we've had some great questions, I believe, posed to each of our speakers, and maybe we can um, cherry pick one for each of our, our speakers, do you think, and get their response? Yes, um, so I can see that um, there's been some discussions in the chat, so um, I'm not sure if maybe um, Helen and, and, and Dave, did you, did you want to say any more from the questions that... Um, hmm. It was, I think I think we we dealt with that. I think it was just a, it was a good question about where the smart meter data comes from. So it, um, in, in short, there is smart meter data that exists, but uh, part of the problem we have is being able to cross reference that against something for specific communities. So there is fairly kind of blind anonymized data that exists in the public domain. But as soon as you try to cross correlate that with something that could allude to something personal about a household. Uh, you're on dodgy ground and that makes it more difficult for us to then use it in a in a, in a model a t the kind of model that, that we're talking about but i put a link in there for some smart meter data that we used but there is yeah there are data sets out there excellent thanks for that dave um rhiannon do we have was there a question posted for sonam i think was it from laura brown yes Quite a long one from Laura, um, and I think uh, Sonam, you have you have answered it, but feel free to, to explain explain your answer a bit more now if you'd like. Uh, yeah, thank you, thank you uh, for a very thought provoking question. Uh, like uh, specifically in the current study, we have really not looked into uh, the uh, the scheme mechanism which is best for the council or the. Uh, one that is suited for the uh, energy companies. Uh, fundamentally, uh, the core of the findings that we have looked at or the effort, research effort that we have been, whoever may be the owner of the community owned energy assets, it could be a council, it could be energy companies, or it could be a aggregator, or it could be a DSO distribution system operator. Mm -hmm. so that our, our mechanism, the proposed mechanism gives these owners a uh, uh, um, a tool to how tool to share this uh, energy and uh, financial benefits obtained from this jointly owned within a member of the community in a fair way. Uh, yeah. Excellent. Yeah, excellent. Thank you, Sonam. I mean, I can imagine how that work extends into the future, where um, you know you have local authorities that all have mandates for decarbonisation. They've got diverse asset bases, building stock. They've got commercial and um, residential tenants. And I think a lot of them will be really interested to try and understand the, the sweet spots in how they may form community coalitions and, and support decarbonization, energy costs, and, and ideally, you know, revenue potential opportunities. So that's, that's really interesting. And um, so thank you for responding to that. Um, and do we have a question for Melinda, Rhiannon? I, I actually had a question for Melinda. So you, you briefly touched on it at the end, but um, it was just in regard to the price formation element of your presentation. Um, sort of, um, it can link to the community or, or retail, but just um, if you had any findings or results in, in, re in response to the price formation um, in particular, uh, the energy community trading aspect of what you're on about, just if you had anything on that. Yeah, basically, so um, as uh, as one can understand, uh, the, uh, the the prices that 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 are uh, uh, 
people experience can actually affect uh, their uh, flexibility, let's say, and uh, how this optimization uh, results uh, uh, actually uh, um, uh, happen. So what we have seen in the simulations is that we have experience with different techniques on the price formation. So for example, um, uh, there are different ways to, 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 to form the, the trading price within the community. So one technique, for example, is called mid-market rate. And this actually takes kind of the import price, the export price, and finds an average. And uh, that means that, you know, the, the community price is, is always kind of, uh, uh, is always sits between the, the export price and the import price and provides a benefit. There are other ways to do that that depend on the supply and the demand ratio, for example. So there, if you have, uh, if you don't have uh, much renewables, then you, you can offer, you can have a high price that is close to the retail price. But if you have plenty of renewables, then the kind of the price collapses and it becomes equal to what they would get as a reward when they sell back to the grid. So all these aspects are quite important. And also it is quite important to say that um, uh, the recent kind of uh, price uh, hike uh, it is very important to, uh, and it can yield different, different, different results, of course, because, uh, so this is what, uh, you know, I wanted to say about the price formation. It's actually a very important uh, aspect that can, can yield different results. Excellent. Thank you very much for that, Melinda. And, and since we do have, we've got a couple of minutes spare, and I can see that there's been a, a question um, put to Dave Jenkins from Benoit relating to could um, you discuss a bit further, you know, the, the challenges with respect to remote control of heat pumps? Is, is that a question you can revert to, Dave? Yeah, so there's, there's again, it's this, this idea of needing to have a stronger link between buildings and, and the networks that serve them. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we might reasonably expect to have a much higher number of, of heat pumps in our homes in the next sort of 10 years or so. So if we, if we want to achieve demand flexibility, we need to control those heat pumps. And we have found actually in, again, the, the project I mentioned in Orkney, the reflex project, um, controllability of heat pumps isn't as straightforward as controllability of, say, electric resistive uh, heating. For two reasons. One is the, the, sort of the actual control process itself is a bit more complicated, but also you are more likely to um, impinge on the performance of the heat pump if, you, uh, if, if you're switching it on and off in a way that it, that it doesn't like it essentially. And demand flexibility is potentially making you want, want to switch that heat pump on and off uh, more times than you'd want. And so it's overall uh, performance coefficient of performance might be detrimentally affected. So I, mean, I don't think that means it's a dead end. I, I think we will, we will find a solution to control heat pumps in an in a efficient and effective, and effective way. But um, I think that is, some, that is an area that we need to put, put more work into as an academic sector to, to work out what if we are going to have millions of these heat pumps and we need to control them because of the demand flexibility require, uh, requirement, um, how's that going to work? How's that going to set up? And, and when we analyze its effectiveness, we need to account for the potentially reduced performance in those heat pumps as we kind of mess about with them a little bit in terms of their uh, operation schedule. Excellent. Excellent. Thanks for that, Dave. I can see we've got a, another question put to you, uh, Melinda, from Laura Brown. Um, asking about, you know, you've reviewed this area of peer-to-peer -peer programs quite extensively in terms of the energy sector and, you know, a, a curiosity to whether you're seeing, you know, more demonstration or uptake recently, you know, are you maybe seeing more demonstrator projects, be it in the UK or, or Europe? Have you, have you noticed any trends in that regard, Melinda? Yeah, so we have, we have, uh, we have, um, done some work, some reviews on look, looking at peer-to-peer -peer programs, local, local energy communities and so on. And uh, this is still a, um, an active uh, space that um, is, it can be a tool that can be quite promising into delivering um, um, uh, better, um, uh, it can kind of encourage more active participation of consumers uh, through these market mechanisms at a local level, but also could achieve a kind of flexibility uh, markets, 
uh, at a local level. So um, it is still an active space and lots of talk and, and demonstrators are, are, are uh, still kind of uh, uh, um, um, going on on, on on this space. Uh, now, the, um, how much of it will be, you know, uh, really peer-to-peer? -peer. So peer-to-peer -peer actually means that a, a, a specific household will communicate with another one on a one-by-one -one basis. It can, mm. They can negotiate and so on. So um, uh, I don't know if this fully decentralized kind of way would, would be achieved, but certainly market solutions, a kind of coordinator at, at the local level, similar at, at you know, what, uh, what we have been doing in this work, uh, maybe are more promising uh, in, in, in this context. And uh, Sonam as well, uh, yeah, he's actively now working and uh, developing uh, also peer-to-peer -peer solutions. So we, we, are, we, are, uh, um, we are working on, on this space. Um, but uh, yes, I agree, it has, it has several challenges uh, to, to, to kind of overcome in order to, to become a useful tool. Excellent. Thank, thank you very much, Melinda. Um, and, and just as we've only got a, a few minutes left, if it's as, as chair, I think I get to make a few closing remarks here. So firstly, I would just like to say, you know, thank you to the three speakers, but not just for the, the great talks today, but for the, the five and a half years of, of brilliant collaboration that has been Pan Institute, it's been interdisciplinary, and what's really impressive in the three examples is, I think everyone can see how close to communities and stakeholders this work has been. As we look to the future, um, you know, only this year we had the UK commit its largest ever budget in its ED2 plans to modernizing our energy networks and data and digital budgets were doubled. The UK Digital Task Force in January uh, this year also highlighted the importance that we need to better understand the threats as well as opportunities for energy citizens. So the kind of research I feel you've really captured excellent in an excellent format today captures the, the social techno-economic issues we need to get a better understanding of at a very local level and at scale. So I, I would like to thank you all for this excellent work, for the manner of your engagement and um, I look forward to um, seeing what comes in the very near future. So thank you all very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, just final final word from me that we've got um, this session actually really nicely linked to our um, next session uh, today at 2 p.m., um, which will be led by, by Harris, um, and that will be on demonstrators. So it links nicely to the community element of this. But thank you all for attending and for the presenters today and David as host. So thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.